Professor Manfred Novak received his PhD from the Law School of the University of Vienna and his LLM uh, from Columbia University. He has been so many things that it is really impossible to describe them all here. It will fill at least the whole afternoon. So let me just take some highlights from his very rich academic uh, career, but also from his very rich career as a very distinguished um, human rights practitioner and advocate. He has been United Nations Special Rapporteur on torture. He has also been United Nations expert on enforced disappearances. He has been judge at the Human Rights Chamber uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He has been or is visiting professor at many, many places. Let me just mention a few. The Danish Institute of Human Rights in Copenhagen, the Raoul uh, Wallenberg Institute mm -hmm. um, of Human Rights at Lund University, the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, EUC, mm -hmm. but I have to say something special about EUC because there is another capacity, the American University, Abo Academy in Turku, the Netherlands Institute of Human Rights uh, in Utrecht, and I should also stress that he has been director there of that institute uh, in the late 1980s, and I can assure you he speaks a perfect Dutch. He is professor of international law and human rights at the University of Vienna, where he has been co-director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights since 1992. More than 500 publications on his name in the field of human rights, public um, international law, development studies, constitutional and administrative law. We have, and now since January, I should almost forget about it, since January, um, he has become the Secretary General of EUC, the, e, the European Inter-University Center for Human Rights, which as you know is based in Venice and takes care of this great EMA, this great European master's program in human rights and democratization. We have been working together for quite a long time, I now realize, including, for instance, um, in the, uh, say, like 10 years ago, on a so-called cost action. The cost action are called the European Union, the role of the European Union in United Nations human rights reform. It was a beautiful cost action that um, uh, Professor Novak chaired and which gave rise to lots of interesting I think, publications and events. And that brings me to the subject matter of today. Because indeed, we studied 10 years ago the EU's contribution to United Nations human rights reform. And that's actually the topic of today. This week, eh, we are only a few days away from that event, the 15th of March, we commemorate, I would say celebrate, 10 years of the United Nations Human Rights Council set up by the General Assembly Resolution 15th of March 2006 and to the coming about of which the European Union and its member states very actively contributed. So this is a real nice case study, I would say, of the contribution of the EU to human rights reform. Whether the reform has been a true success, we will have to learn from the lecture. And as you see, the title of the lecture is about achievements, but also about challenges. So I hope that this works enough in terms of the teaser, and I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Novak. Thanks, Jan, uh, very much for this a bit exaggerated introduction. Um, good afternoon, I'm very happy, I'm very honored uh, to be here. Um, at one of these so-called high-level uh, lectures. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also happy uh, to speak about 10 years of the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, which is a topic, uh, an organization, a body that interests me uh, very much. As you know, <clears throat> and Jan said it already, it's more or less exactly now in March, 10 years ago, that the General Assembly, by this famous resolution 6 251, established the Human Rights Council as the highest uh, political body of the United Nations dealing uh, with uh, human rights. <clears throat> and thereby it replaced the former Commission on Human Rights, which was established in 1946, foreseen in the UN Charter, Article 68, um, which uh, as it was said, it was a highly discredited body, it was highly politicized and uh, selective, and uh, even um, former 
Secretary General Kofi Annan criticized the Commission, and I quote, had been discredited by states which had sought membership not to strengthen human rights but to protect themselves against criticism. And he proposed a totally different, much smaller body. I, and uh, as you said already, I had been um, quite for a long time closely involved in the Human Rights Commission. Between 1968 and 93, I was a member of the Austrian governmental delegation, what the Americans call public members, so as an independent expert, but still somehow under the instructions of, uh, of the government. So I know it a little bit from the governmental side until 93. And between 93 and 2010, uh, I always had some kind of different um, expert functions for the Human Rights Commission, in particular in the field of enforced disappearances, working group, uh, special process of missing persons in former Yugoslavia, um, and other mandates, including then the Special Rapporteur on Torture. So I know it a little bit from the side of government and the side of uh, independent experts, but of course I also have been in quite a few non-governmental organizations, the International Service for Human Rights uh, and others uh, that were criticizing uh, at the same time engaging with the Human Rights Commission from an NGO perspective. And I must confess I did not belong to those who criticized uh, the Human Rights Commission um, that much uh, because I think that the Commission has come quite a long way from the old days, and I'm speaking about the 1950s and 60s, the no power to take action doctrine, where the Commission did not address any kind of practical human rights issues. Um, but then, since the late 1960s, 70s, uh, under these famous resolutions uh, 1235 and 1503, really uh, slowly developing uh, also special procedures. The first one was the Working Group on South Africa, already established in 1967. Then having a fairly selective period, 1970s, the outcasts, South Africa, Israel, Chile. Um, but then since the 1980s, developing um, what I would say a, a fairly effective triad. So of course it's the states that are members of the Commission and the Council, uh, and the only ones they can vote. Uh, but uh, at the same time, independent experts played a more and more important role in the Commission, what we call today special procedures, special rapporteurs, working groups, etc. Um, but, and I think that was the main, one of the main achievements of the Commission, to really integrate non governmental organizations with the right to speak, with the right to bring victims in the time of the Cold War, that all of a sudden. Uh, some famous dissidents from the Soviet Union were speaking in the Commission, the same room where the, uh, the, the, the Soviet uh, governmental officials were speaking uh, at home, they would have been immediately arrested, and here they could speak with them. That was at that time a huge uh, achievement. Um, and also later developing all kinds of thematic uh, mechanisms. So, I think this triangle worked quite well. The Commission only worked for six weeks. That was a disadvantage, March, April in Geneva. But it was a huge, the biggest human rights conference every year where more than 3,000 people were coming together, governmental people, NGOs, indigenous peoples, uh, media, uh, you name it, um, and really discussing the main uh, human rights um, issues. Um, so, it, um, Chile Kenja, one of famous Polish uh, professor Poznan, um, once called uh, the Human Rights Commission and Council a kind of a global parliament on human rights. I think that's a quite good uh, expression what it is actually doing. Now, I, I made this short excursion back into the history because <clears throat> if you want to really assess today uh, the success or failure of the Human Rights Council, we have to compare it to the Commission. We have to say, does it, is it better? 
than the former commission, or is it worse, or is it about the same? Uh, so what are actually the achievements in comparison to the commission, but also what are the major um, challenges? Um, for that, I give you a very short, and I apologize to those who say it, we know that anyway, but I, I talked before, there might also be some persons who, who are not that well familiar with it. What are the main differences between the former commission and the council? Now, the one is the status. The commission was a functional commission of ECOSOC. Uh, the council is a subsidiary body of the General Assembly. The word council already indicates it's one of the main bodies, like the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council. We have now also finally a Human Rights Council, although, of course, it's not one of the main bodies because we would have needed an amendment at the UN Charter. Um, but still, it's higher. Um, the composition, um, Kofi Annan wanted a small body, 18 people or so, like the Security Council. Uh, after long negotiations, they then reduced from 53 to 47. So it's not a big change. But, and that is important, they fixed the regional representation. Because in the old days, the West was kind of overrepresented, which was widely criticized. Now we have uh, from the 47, 13 from Africa, 13 from Asia. Together, 26 is a comfortable majority of uh, the, Afri uh, the African Asian bloc, including, of course, the, um, the NAM, the Non Aligned Movement, uh, uh, the African Union, but also the organization of the Islamic Corporation. And we will see then at the beginning they really exercise their power um, in, a, in a quite strong way. One of the main uh, kind of most controversial issues when the, as the, when, when the resolution was negotiated was, but we only want to have the angels in there. Yeah. Uh, we should, we, that, that was, the commission was bad because some of the, um, the bad apples were also sitting uh, in the commission. Uh, the Americans were very strong about that, uh, saying uh, you have to have the highest standards uh, of, of human rights, and others said that the first ones who have to go out are the Americans uh, under the Bush administration. Um, so, um, but still, the resolution says uh, that you should only be a member if you uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. <coughs> which would actually mean that uh, many of the main players, uh, permanent members of the Security Council, China, Russian Federation, would certainly not be allowed to sit on the Council. Um, I think it's simply unrealistic. It's a political body, and in a political body, you, you must have a fair representation of also the powerful states. Otherwise, it's, politically speaking, uh, not, not a useful body. But at least, you can exclude some of the worst violators of human rights. So I hope, so, so far, for instance, North Korea um, was avoided to become a member um, of, the, um, of the Human Rights Council. Um, and, and that is also important, uh, now <clears throat> the General Assembly has the power by a two-thirds majority to suspend membership. And we had one case, Libya, in 2011. The Gaddafi regime was expelled from the Council Last year there was some discussion about Burundi, but uh, finally Burundi was elected, which is not a very good sign. In September 2015, elect Burundi into the Human Rights Council when the situation is very, very serious and uh, might even lead to another genocide. Um, also, states should make voluntary pledges and commitments. And I think that's good. So if you want to be elected, you should pledge, for instance, that you ratify some of the key human rights treaties or the, you invite special procedures or any other kind of uh, commitment. <laughs> Third one is the sessions. As I told you, the commission only met for one session, six weeks. In 1992, with respect to former Yugoslavia, they started to have by one half could ask for special sessions, but there were only very few. Uh, and now it is uh, three regular sessions plus one third, so a minority right, 
can convene a special session, that means uh, 16 states um, can, can do that. Um, that is already, uh, I think, a big advantage, and we will see in the course of the years we have almost as many special sessions than we have regular sessions. Um, universal periodic review. That is seen as the most innovative feature. We haven't had that before, that every of the 100 now 93 member states is undergoing in a four, now four and a half years cycle, uh, a general peer review of all, if, of its general human rights um, performance. Um, and that was seen also by the South as the main tool against the selectivity of the old commission. Of course, in the minds of many southern states was, then we can get rid of all this uh, um, naming and shaming. That means also country-specific uh, special procedures, etc. Um, and the universal periodic review, as I said, is a peer review. So states provide a report, what they will have done, positively or not done. Um, and then it is reviewed by other states, there's a Troika, etc. Um, but and that was again something the EU really strongly demanded during the negotiation, that it's not only the state report, there are also two other reports compiled by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, one on the most important conclusions and recommendations of treaty bodies and uh, uh, special procedures, so UN expert bodies. The other one also uh, a summary of the most important uh, reports, criticism by, the, by civil society, non-governmental organizations, also <coughs> national human rights institutions, etc. And if you take all those three reports together, I think it is giving you already a fairly good entry point if you want to know what's going on in a particular country in the field of human rights. Um, so, but still at the end, of course, this working group of the council then comes up with recommendations. There might be hundreds of recommendations and the state is free to accept which, or to decide which recommendations it accepts and which one it says uh, we, are, we are thinking about and rejects. Um, but I, I will come again back to, to an assessment. We have an advisory committee of 18 people, that's independent experts, replacing the former sub-commission on the uh, promotion and protection of human rights um, with somewhat less powers. Uh, the sub-commission was seen as to be too active, too proactive, uh, also taking up country situations that was eliminated in 1999 already. Uh, but now they couldn't do anything anymore on their own initiative. So it's a think tank, but only in reaction to being invited by the council. We also have the old confidential and public complaints procedures, 1503 procedure, um, which is a little bit anachronistic, I would say, today. Um, and, of course, uh, the special procedures, so the special rapporteurs, have in principle been taken over. So that's... Um, somehow the differences, and I will come back to that at the end when I assess. Um, if we now want to assess the practice of the Human Rights Council, I distinguish two major uh, periods. The initial period, the first five years between 2006 and 2010, and then the recent five years since 2011, which of course, where the Arab Spring played a very important role in really changing the, di the dynamics, and also where the Obama administration entered the stage, because the Bush administration from the beginning said, we don't want to have to do anything with them, um, this is not a useful body, and Obama again, um, multilateralism, and, uh, and the Obama administration did play a quite important role because at the beginning kind of the Western ideas and values were really left to the European Union to defend and a few other states. Um, so the EU felt itself at the beginning in a fairly isolated position. We have to do it alone and we only have <coughs> seven, sometimes eight members, but it's a, a very small minority. So we have to build alliances, uh, primarily with the Gulag, 
the Latin American groups, but that was also not enough. So Europe, Europe and the Latin Americans don't have a majority. So you need to really build cross-country and cross-regional alliances, and that was at the beginning very difficult for the European Union, which also has to do a little bit with its fairly heavy decision-making, uh, unanimity, etc., procedure. Um, in particular, also before the entry into force of the uh, Lisbon Treaty. Um, And of course, one also has to say that the, the, the timing couldn't have been worse if you think about uh, the global political situation. In 2005, it was just uh, two years after the American invasion in Iraq. Uh, it was still 9-11, uh, uh, the Bush administration, Putin on the other side. So the new kind of North-South conflict uh, being being very, very strong. So it was difficult at that time already to negotiate uh, the, the General Assembly resolution and really to start with. Um, I'm, I'm not going into details, but uh, we were at a certain point, and I was as a special rapporteur appointed in 2004. So I was just in the office uh, when we changed to the council. And we were threatened. It was, I mean, there were many states, and uh, now you had this uh, um, new kind of uh, uh, alliances, uh, the, the NAM, also the Non-Aligned Movement, 120 states, but then uh, the, the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation, 57 <laughs> states, and some of them, and the African Group, African Union, the League of Arab States, and some states became major actors. The ambassador of Algeria, for instance, was one of the most powerful persons. Because he represented the, the African Union, the League of Arab States, the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation. So he had three or four hats, uh, or the ambassador of Egypt, etc. Um, and they really <coughs> wanted, in fact, to get rid of the independent experts. So they succeeded to delete some of the country's specific mandates, uh, Belarus, for instance, or Cuba, later Sudan. Um, but they also wanted to uh, abolish some of the more outspoken um, uh, classical uh, thematic mandates. For instance, my colleague Philip Alston was at that time special rapporteur on summary executions, and uh, it was on the edge whether they would not have just abandoned, abandoned the mandate, and also my mandate was under, under attack. Um, and uh, then they developed this code of conduct for special procedures, and I was involved a little bit in the negotiations. Um, so one thing what they said is, whenever you do a fact-finding mission, you can only publish a report after the government has accepted it. So you are assessing the situation in, uh, I don't know, uh, any kind of country, and the government has a veto right to say, no, no, we don't accept this, and we don't accept then you can abolish it. Uh, we were not anymore allowed to speak to the media because they realized that it was a fairly strong tool that we had. And I should say it is really thanks to the diplomats of the European Union um, that, uh, <coughs> that the worst actually could be avoided in this difficult time. Um, Jan Wouters, in one of your publications, you speak about his first years as being <coughs> disastrous in, in referring to others that have, have, have said that. It. And it's, it's, it's really true. It was simply defending what we... Uh, what we had. Um, and if you look then also in the first years on, uh, on selectivity, the first special sessions were all on Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, and uh, of course it was done by this coalition and they had a the clear majority, they could do whatever they wanted. Um, and then even having commissions of inquiry like the Goldstone and whatever and telling them uh, but if you go to Lebanon, uh, you can only actually look into what Israel did, and you are not allowed to criticize uh, the um, Hezbollah or any of the other groups. Uh, um, so it was very, very one-sided. Um, and um, uh, so the first until between 2006 and December 2010, we had a total of 15 regular and 14 special <coughs> sessions. Of the 14 special, special sessions, two were devoted to global thematic issues, 
the world food crisis requested by Cuba and the economic and financial crisis requested by Egypt. And the remaining 12 sessions were devoted to country-specific situations of which half, six sessions dealt with Israel, um, and only the other half then with other countries. And that were all special sessions that were requested by the European Union. Um, and that was, uh, and they started already, the first one um, was on Sudan, Darfur, um, in, uh, in late uh, 2006 already, then uh, Myanmar 2007, France requested on the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Germany requested a session on Sri Lanka, but the outcome was a disaster. Um, so it was a special session on Sri Lanka. The government of Sri Lanka was always extremely good in lobbying for itself. Sometimes they came with four or five ministers at the same time. Uh, and the outcome was a resolution which Sri Lanka itself has actually um, drafted and put to a vote. And uh, there it is praised for whatever it has done. Uh, and uh, only the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, were actually criticized for human rights violations. So that might also be the outcome of a special session. A real change was Cote d'Ivoire um, by the end of uh, 2010, because it's for the first time that Nigeria, on behalf of the African group, uh, was requesting a special session on Cote d'Ivoire after these disputed elections uh, in 2010. Um, and that is, in my opinion, a turning point. That is when this uh, uh, block voting and block initiatives were all of a sudden so an African state and an African group was for the first time asking for a special session on an African state. That was unheard of before. Um, and that led to a fairly strong resolution which then also influenced the Security Council. As you know, uh, soon thereafter, the Security Council adopted a resolution in the context of the responsibility to protect um, on Cote d'Ivoire. Um, the Universal Periodic Review, I must say, I at the beginning I have been writing a few articles where I said it simply can't be. Peer review uh, is not a good idea. States assessing human rights in other states that can only be political uh, and not useful. Um, and I cited the old experience. I don't know uh, whether you still remember when the two covenants were adopted in 1966. Um, for the covenant on civil and political rights, the Human Rights Committee was established. Uh, as an independent expert body to review the state reports. That is useful. State reports and an independent expert body is then reviewing it uh, and coming up with observations and recommendations to the country what it should change, improve, etc. However, for political reasons in the time of the Cold War, um, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights did not establish an independent expert body, but said ECOSOC should do that, the Economic, Social and Cultural, as a Economic and Social Council, one of the main political bodies of the UN. So the ambassador sitting there should actually review the situation in the right to health, the right to education, and uh, other uh, economic and social rights. And they realized very quickly it simply doesn't work. So it, they established an workshop, no, a, a working group on governmental experts, it also didn't work, and finally in 1985, ECOSOC said that is not useful, so we established also by ECOSOC resolution the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is an independent expert body, and since that time it works perfectly well um, in reviewing state reports. So that was my experience, and I said now we are going back to the 1950s or 60s when we had this kind of peer review. Um, but I must say, I changed my opinion. Um, I really didn't think that UPR could work, um, and uh, it, it worked in the sense that all 193 states actually comply. Why do they do that? The state reporting procedure before treaty bodies is 
partly a disaster. States simply don't deliver their reports. Or 10 years later, and then they are not sending somebody uh, to come when, when it is actually examined, etc. And all of a sudden, they do it. Exactly on the date, they come with a high level delegation. Why? I have two explanations, but I'm interested whether others have had others. I think the one is that this was the big success for the Global South. They said, that is our tool against the selectivity. So they put a lot of pressure on their peers, on other states saying, you have to come on the 10th of December when your uh, report is on the agenda, um, and you have to deliver the report in time, you have to come with a high-level delegation there of ministers and, and uh, to do that. I think that was um, uh, one reason, and the second reason I said already before is that it's not only a state report, we also have other information, um, and states are under a pressure at the end, if, if a state at the end says, okay, whatever the other states say, we are not interested, we simply don't accept any of the recommendations, it doesn't look nice. I mean, you have to, if you engage in this, uh, in this dialogue, you should also at least accept a few recommendations. And it's a combination. It's a very public exercise. You have already domestically, uh, civil society and uh, national human rights institutions, academics, that actually say, but at this UPR, we want that uh, this country should actually ratify this treaty or change certain laws. Uh, so the government is under fairly strong pressure um, because it has so much public attention. Um, so in reality, I think the UPR is a success story. Of course, there are also weaknesses. I still remember very well when Cuba and China uh, manipulated the list of speakers. So they had to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, all their friends, not China is excellent in lobbying, all their friends, uh, Pakistan and, and, and North Korea, whatever, they're all coming and speaking and saying it's beautiful, you're a champion of human rights. And when the Western delegates stood up in the morning, uh, tried to get on the speaker's list, they said, sorry, the speaker's list is full, we don't have more time for you. So um, that was a disaster. Cuba was similar, um, but that was then changed in the, in the, in the, there was an official review <coughs> process, and, and in 2011 they said, um, you don't have to get up at six in the morning to be able to speak, we have a, an equal timing so that every state that wants to speak uh, can actually uh, speak. Yeah, so we, I think there was the beginning of the shift from bipolar dynamics towards more cross-regional initiatives, and that brings me to the second uh, part, um, the, the periods starting in, in, in 2011, and of course that is very clearly related to the uprisings in the Arab Spring, when they moved from Tunisia and Egypt uh, to Libya, uh, in the beginning of 2011, and, and Gaddafi was uh, reacting in the, in the strongest terms against originally peaceful demonstrators, uh, in particular the opposition stronghold of Benghazi. Uh, the EU was very quick, I should say, and called for a special session on Libya for the 25th of February 2011. Um, and uh, against any kind of expectations at that time, um, the, uh, the Human Rights Council in this special session already established an ad hoc international high-level commission of inquiry um, and uh, for the first time called on the General Assembly to suspend the membership of Libya. Of course, there are many reasons behind. The ambassador, in fact, was already on the side of the opposition, but uh, uh, and, and Gaddafi simply has not understood the new dynamics, that he as a very powerful leader all of a sudden was going more into uh, an, a more and more isolated position. Um, and um, the General Assembly quickly also suspended Libya's membership, but more importantly, the Human Rights Council has called upon the Security Council to take action. And one day after, on the 26th of February, the Human Rights Council already, uh, sorry, the Security Council already adopted its famous Resolution 1970, 
in the context of the responsibility to protect, um, referred the situation of Libya to the International Criminal Court, and also imposed targeted sanctions, asset freeze, and travel bans, uh, and arms embargo. Um, so that was um, a very, very quick reaction. Since Gaddafi didn't really change it, his policies, then soon afterwards, Resolution 1973, that's the third pillar of the RTP, uh, was adopted authorizing a no-fly zone, and in fact, military action with the exception of ground forces, and we know uh, what, what happened afterwards. So however we now, in retrospective, um, evaluate the application of R2B in Libya, but it was a situation where the Human Rights Council uh, all of a sudden uh, acted in a totally different manner, um, and, uh, the, and that had to do also with the fact that all the regional groups were in principle finally asking the United Nations Security Council. So it was even the OIC, but the League of Arab States, the African Union, they all together said, we have to do something to protect uh, the, the people in Libya against uh, the military attacks by the Gaddafi forces. Um, soon afterwards, Syria started very similar uh, situation when uh, President Assad, Assad soon responded in an as brutal manner um, against, again, originally peaceful demonstrators. Um, and uh, already in April 2011, the EU succeeded to convene a first special session on Syria, two more in 2011, another one in 2012. And that was, for me, extremely interesting to see that in the Human Rights Council, the ones who were against strong action, again, the Commission of Inquiry, etc., uh, were in a very small minority. So that two of the permanent members of the Security Council, China and the Russian Federation, were really isolated, has never been before in the Human Rights Commission or the Human Rights Council. So often these were carried by a huge majority of states from all regions, and only Cuba, China, and Russia were voting against, sometimes Ecuador. Um, so there was, again, you saw a new dynamic. These were cross-regional alliances. However, they didn't lead to any kind of action by the Security Council because China and Russia, of course, blocked them. Um, but that changed the dynamics. So Sweden, for instance, took the lead um, in, in getting a, res a resolution on Iran. And again, we had a special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran, which would have been unthinkable three years or two years earlier. Um, as I told you, Belarus was already abolished at the beginning. And now the EU took this new dynamics and said, uh, we should, Belarus is not really better than it has been. And within two years, as in 2012, we have a special rapporteur in Belarus again. Um, also, um, again, an African initiative in relation to Eritrea. Was Djibouti, Nigeria, and Somalia took the initiative, and we, since that time, we have a special rapporteur on the situation in Eritrea, in particular also investigating strong repression against human rights defenders. Um, Senegal introduced uh, a resolution against Mali. So that, that was, as I said before, uh, would have been in, in, impossible. Um, also on substantive issues. Um, at the beginning, we had this infamous defamation of religion. Resolutions which always were sponsored and introduced by the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation, in fact saying uh, um, restricting freedom of expression to the extent that whenever you say something that might uh, be negative on, uh, on religion in general or on the Muslim religion in, in particular, then, uh, then this should be penalized, etc. Um, the West always opposed it, but with a huge majority, these resolutions were adopted. Um, and that, uh, that was not the EU, but the United States, primarily, as soon as they entered. Uh, they changed the dynamics, and with a cross-regional um, 
uh, initiative um, that uh, quite a number of, of countries, uh, so that they really change then um, the, the, the title and the, and the contents. So it is now called Combating Intolerance, Negative Stereotyping and Stigmatization of and Discrimination, Incitement to Violence, and Violence Against Persons Based on Religion and Belief. So it's much more hate speech and hate crime uh, where a consensus actually could be achieved. Um, Argentina, Morocco, and Switzerland uh, introduced something that the Latin Americans always wanted, a special rapporteur on the right to the truth, which was carried all of a sudden. Uh, even more surprising, uh, if you know that um, uh, LGBTI rights and uh, gender identity is a uh, highly controversial issue uh, where you have uh, the whole Afri most of the African group and, and others against. And in 2011, South Africa and Brazil together initiated a re resolution on sexual orientation and gender identity with the support of under other Latin American and Western states. And it was adopted by majority in the council. Um, with an independent expert of the environment and human rights, which the European Union was not so happy, but uh, again, um, so there were really many changes. So I, I see 2011 as really uh, a major, um, a major turning point. Um, although this official review process uh, was had very meager results, um, we had now. A, President of the Council for the old year with, with an office. So some minor amendments, but not, not much. Now quickly, um, the remaining years, um, 2013, was the only year without any kind of special session, but we had uh, new uh, special rapporteurs of the Central African Republic um, and yeah, Mali, North Korea, um, but then there was a quite interesting and disturbing a new development when uh, Sri Lanka was heavily criticizing the office, of the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in relation to a report that had to do with the uh, Reconciliation uh, Commission in relation to the 2009 events uh, when the LTTE was uh, uh, defeated by the Sri Lankan military and major crimes had been committed by Sri Lanka. Um, and rather than taking this, uh, this up stronger in relation to Sri Lanka, um, they decided uh, that uh, there should be, um, there was a resolution uh, which asked the Office of the High Commissioner to present an overview of the composition of its staff. Um, so a strong attack on the independence of the High Commissioner. And uh, the year afterwards, uh, there was a very, very long discussion um, where, again, the European Union defended very much the independence, but there were many states that strongly attacked um, the independence of the High Commissioner and really wanted to put it under some, some kind of state uh, macro uh, management, micro management. <clears throat> What was strong in 2013 was a high-level uh, International Commission of Inquiry on North Korea. Um, Michael Kirby, the famous Australian judge, was the, the, the chairperson. Um, <clears throat> there was an independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons. And that's again quite interesting because there is a move from the Global South that they say, uh, the UN should adopt a convention on the rights of older persons uh, falling under these vulnerable groups, which the EU also says that it defends. Uh, but in fact, it's the EU that so far has uh, obstructed uh, these, uh, these uh, developments. Um, yeah, 2014, we had sessions on the Central African Republic uh, again, Gaza and Iraq, but already more related to the Islamic State. Um, and um, um, a special rapporteur on the rights of persons with disabilities, uh, and a highly controversial special rapporteur on the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures on the enjoyment of human rights. But then also a discussion about the negative impacts of 
vulture funds, also hedge funds in principle, on the enjoyment of human rights where uh, the EU was split. Um, similar, there was a, a split resolution on armed drones um, where um, I think Ireland was the only European state that voted in favor. At the same time, uh, France and the United Kingdom strongly voted against, and the other EU members abstained. So even within the European Union, uh, a split. And finally, last year, we had two special sessions. One was really on a non-state actor, Boko Haram, um, and the other one on Burundi. Um, as I said before, already Burundi to prevent the further deterioration into genocide. But at the same time, behind the scenes, states thought, but actually we should exclude Burundi uh, from the Human Rights Council, what didn't really uh, work out. And we have a new special rapporteur on the right of privacy in the digital age, again cross-regional Brazil and Germany as the main sponsors. They started already in the GA after the revelation of the Edward Snowden um, uh, reports. Um, and um, uh, so that's an interesting new development on uh, yeah, how to limit uh, surveillance. Um, and uh, we have an independent expert on the enjoyment of human rights of persons with albinism. Um, that was an Algerian initiative in the African group. So it's quite, quite uh, now um, much more diverse. Um, also a new resolution on human rights democracy and the rule of law, so establishing a new forum similar to the forum on minority rights. Um, and of course, uh, in the last years, uh, more and more discussion centered on migration, uh, the crisis of the refugee policies, uh, and Europe and the European Union felt more and more attacked uh, in the Human Rights Council both by the former High Commissioner uh, Nari Pillay from South Africa, but also the current High Commissioner Said Rad al Hussein uh, from Jordan, uh, speaking out very, very strongly at the failure of Europe to, to deal in a, in, a, in a dignified manner with the, with the refugee and, and migration situation. And of course, uh, you mentioned before François Crepeau, who was here as the uh, as, a, as a European uh, special rapporteur on the rights of migrants, uh, strongly criticizing the European migration policy. So there's a new dynamics also, um, and, uh, and the EU finds itself more and more on the defensive. Time is running, so I'm not going into really more into the role of the European Union. Come to my, uh, of course, also a major change is of course, the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, um, the External Action Service, uh, the uh, High Representative and the EU Special Representative on Human Rights, uh, Stavros Lambrinidis, um, and of course, the permanent Quorum Chair. All that had a new dynamics in, uh, in um, better coordinating also uh, the, the European Union uh, input, the strategic framework of 2012, the two EU action plans, all had an input in a much more strategic way how the European Union is also acting uh, in the uh, United Nations Human Rights um, uh, Council. And in principle, one can say that the EU lived up to its own strategies in relation to but it's classically kind of interest. So for instance, when it is about the independence of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the, to, to defend the independence of special procedures and treaty bodies, to defend human rights defenders and their independence, civil society, then the European Union is extremely uh, successful against the majority of other states that are much more hostile. Um, also, most of the initiatives are in the field of civil and political rights. Um, but uh, when it comes to economic, social, and cultural rights, then I think the uh, EU, although it says in its, or in particular in the new action plan, really we should do much more on economic, social, and cultural rights, but then when these issues are taken up in the Human Rights Council, usually 
the EU is saying, ah, but those are not really human rights. And uh, um, so uh, there is really an ambiguity, and I think one of the main outcomes also of the, so far of the frame project is that is a major issue. Uh, as long as you don't take economic, social, and cultural rights seriously, you are not living up to the indivisibility and interdependence of all human rights. They are very close to the heart of the countries in the global south, and you will be seen as very selective. Uh, the EU is seen as selective. The same also country-specific. If you analyze that, it's very much uh, in relation to economically weak or isolated states, um, and uh, the EU is much less outspoken when it goes about its own trade partners and, and allies, even if their human rights violations are as serious as in, 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 in other countries. So uh, the EU is criticized as being, uh, as being uh, selective. Uh, the former High Commissioner once said, I think in 2013, um, the real litmus test for the indivisibility also would be the ratification of the optional protocol to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. The individual complaints procedure, that's a classic in Western, we always wanted individual complaints, the others wanted state reports. Uh, the EU always obstructed the, already the drafting of the protocol, and now we have eight states all together, finally, out of the 28 that ratified the, uh, the optional protocol. Um, so that's not uh, a very... Uh, so they are so far failing this little test, I would say. Um, yeah, finally, I would say if you look at the composition, also the main criticism being too selective, being too, too political, politicized, I would say at the beginning, the Council did worse than the former Commission. If we now take the 10 years, I would say it's about the same. It is uh, not, uh, not less politicized, but it's also not more politicized. It's simply uh, when states are discussing human rights issues, this is politicized. Um, but I don't think that's a progress, but also it's not um, a, a failure. Um, the composition the same, uh, some of the worst human rights violators could be prevented from joining the council, but that was the same in the old commission, uh, that was the same, same discussion that we had. Um, the special sessions, that certainly progress. I think that's a new element uh, that gives also the EU, or EU together with Gulag, uh, or other countries, a possibility to say we react very quickly to a human rights emergency um, and adopt a, a resolution, sometimes immediately a commission of inquiry that does have an impact, as we have seen, for instance, in, in Libya or in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, um, and if we take all the special sessions now together, um, of the, there were 21 now special sessions in those 10 years, seven of them dealt with Israel, so it's one third, not anymore one half, four with Syria. And then if you look at the other states, Sudan, Myanmar, Congo, Sri Lanka, Haiti, Cote d'Ivoire, Central African Republic, Burundi, Iraq, Boko Haram, um, it is a fairly representative uh, blacklist, as we called it before, of states where there are serious uh, human rights uh, violations. Um, UPR already, I, I, and I should also say this high level commissions of inquiry are a very important new element in addition to special rapporteurs because, because of being very high level. Um, and um, so we had already in Darfur the first one and, uh, and uh, in relation to Israel but also to uh, uh, to Syria, to Libya, North Korea, the mo most recent report, which is a very, very strong report, speaking about crimes against humanity uh, and actually demanding that North Korea should be uh, submitted to the, uh, to the International Criminal Court and strong action by the Security uh, Council. Um, yeah, UPR is said, I think finally UPR is, is a success. Um, 
also because it's, for instance, I did after I finished my mandate uh, an EU sponsored um, project in assisting governments uh, in implementing or preventing torture. Uh, governments that were willing in principle doing that. And I was amazed. Togo was one country, Paraguay another, Moldova. I was amazed how well even the highest, the prime minister, other ministers, high level governmental officials know exactly what were the recommendations that the government has accepted. I, I was amazed about that. And of course the EU delegation there or other donors can use that very well. You are no longer coming to a country and saying as the EU you should do that because we Europeans think that's good for you. You simply come and say, we offer assistance. Assistance to your government in order that you better implement the recommendations that you voluntarily accepted in Geneva. It's a totally different approach uh, and a more effective one. Um, the EU has really, is, and also others, are taking that up and saying, we assist governments in implementing uh, these, these recommendations. Um, and at the beginning, uh, we said that uh, they wanted to abolish special procedures. Um, in the moment, we have more than we have ever had before. We have 41 thematic mandate holders uh, and 14 country-specific mandate holders. So that's altogether 55. We have never had that in the... Uh, and they are going in all civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, but as I said, also issues like uh, the economic and financial crisis, uh, poverty, foreign debt, climate change, right to environment, human rights and business, a more equitable international order, illicit financial flows and tax evasion, the impact of hedge funds and the enjoyment of human rights, uh, the effect of unilateral coercive measures. Um, and I think that's also where uh, the EU has to accept that these are not issues that only should be dealt with in the World Trade Organization or any other of those bodies. They are genuine human rights issues. And I think if the West finally can be convinced that these topics are at the core of the future human rights policies um, and take decisive steps to revise the current global economic order towards more equality and global justice, then I think that the Human Rights Council might turn out to become a big success story as the facilitator for this change of economic policies. The adoption of the Agenda 2030 with the Sustainable Development Goals in September last year by the General Assembly, I think was a very important first step. And if the Human Rights Council would be willing to really adopt a human rights-based approach in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals, then I think uh, we can say it was worthwhile to replace the Commission by the Council. Sorry for being long, but thank you very much for your attention.